Hello Rebooters, one and all. This is Noah Church and I'm sitting down with one of my personal heroes, Gary Wilson. <music> Gary was one of the first people who opened my eyes up to the potential harms of pornography use in the long term, pornography addiction and porn induced erectile dysfunction. When I saw his TED talk, The Great Porn Experiment, that was a light bulb moment for me, and I know it's been the same for thousands of other people. I think it has around 7 million views at this point, right? I think so. And his website is yourbrainonporn.com, which is the best resource for finding out all the modern research and recovery stories about porn addiction and recovery. And I'd just like to thank you for being here with me here in Houston. My pleasure. Great to see you again. Good to see you. So can you tell people a little bit about what inspired you to tackle this as an issue? Yeah, that's always the question, and it is a little bit complex. Uh, I had a background in anatomy and physiology and pathology and taught it for years. My wife and I wrote books, uh, wrote a book several years ago, and it was about uh, the neurobiology of bonding, mating, falling in love, orgasm, ejaculation. In addition, she also had a website, and that website had many articles on it about the same subject. The key point is that it had key words in these articles, such as dopamine, ejaculation, orgasm, mm -hmm. erection, sex, etc. So evidently, Google put together these key words, and in about 2006, men started to trickle in and post on her forum that had nothing to do with porn or addiction. Mm -hmm. It was a relationship site. And they said, hey, you know, we think we have a porn addiction and maybe my penis isn't working because of the porn addiction. <laughs> and my wife says, uh, what are you doing here? Well, we need some advice. Well, why here? Well, you're non-religious and you have some science-based articles. Well, as time went along, Google put together their posts and, and it became a recovery place because as guys put in keywords, they mm -hmm. found it. This went on for a few years. Uh, we started to see men recover from porn-induced sexual problems, and in doing that, they also uh, experienced benefits that were quite unexpected, such as social anxiety decreasing, confidence increasing, they were less tired, they had less brain fog, they had more motivation, they found real partners exciting, on and on and on. Well, about 2009, 2010, uh, my wife started to write on Psychology Today. She decided to publish a few articles about what the men were experiencing, and the motivation behind that was that the men kept asking, my goodness, why isn't this information out here? I didn't know that my erectile dysfunction could be caused by internet porn, or my inability to orgasm, or my morphing sexual taste. There's just this huge gap. So since there was this huge gap between what they saw on the internet and what they heard from experts and what was reality, mm -hmm. we decided to fill in a little bit of a gap because those men were suffering. Some were even suicidal when they arrived. So we thought that it was important. So we wrote a few articles and then that created more of a flood. And then in January 2011, she said, my website's a mess. We need to get these guys off there. Yeah. And you create a a website that has all the information, you know, recovery stories, mm -hmm. science, uh, articles, research, so that they can easily find it. And that's what I did. And then I created Your Brain on Porn. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the beginning of this whole entire and thing. Where did your knowledge base about neurology and neuroscience come from? Well, when I taught anatomy and physiology and pathology, I also mm -hmm. taught about the nervous system. So I taught pathology about the nervous system. I taught anatomy and physiology of the nervous system. But uh, years prior to, to YBOP, for a good decade, I had delved deeply into the neurobiology of sex and mating and bonding. And of course, those are the same places in the brain, in fact, addiction hijacks many of those same circuits and places and reward systems so I became very familiar with the mechanisms in neurobiology before I started to delve deeper into addiction mechanisms. And yourbrainonporn.com launched in 2011? 12? Yeah, January 2011. Right, and back then was there much research specific to internet porn addiction and compulsive use? No, mostly they were 
looking at the research in sex addiction, mm -hmm. what they refer to as hypersexuality, and trying to decide whether they want to put that in the DSM, and that was mostly really the population base of that was uh, middle-aged men who were cheating on their wives or going to prostitutes. So looking at the neurology of internet porn, there was absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And how about in the last few years? We've seen a lot more studies come out. What do you think the most important things we've learned from that are? We've learned that internet porn addiction looks like other addictions. Mm -hmm. In fact, it may more closely align with drug addictions than other behavioral addictions such as compulsive eating, uh, pathological gambling and such. And it's I say that because there's also been in this interim about 180 internet addiction brain studies, fMRIs, CAT scans, EEGs, and their findings are very much aligned with the findings in drug addiction. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that internet porn will be even more aligned with drug addiction because interesting enough, when you look at studies, uh, especially animal studies, you find that the circuits, the very specific nerve cells that are activated for sexual activity and orgasm are the exact ones activated for cocaine, meth, and heroin. So, right. And that differs from food and water and salt and other things. So, mm -hmm. so it should align pretty, pretty much with... Yeah, I've heard some people say, well, if behavioral addiction is really a thing, then shouldn't you be able to get addicted to any type of behavior like playing golf or something? So that's what makes sex different is that there are specific neurons that only respond to sexual cues, right? Yes, so there's circuits and very important places, little tiny places in the hypothalamus, etc., that have evolved for sex. And then wouldn't that make sense? Because that's what we're supposed to do, yeah. to reproduce. It's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And so there is no circuit for golf or basketball or football. We may find them enjoyable, but first of all, they don't activate those same circuits. Secondly, they don't release the level of neurochemicals that golf mm -hmm. does. We know the difference between making a putt and having an orgasm. And the reason we know the difference is because they are way different <laughs> in the brain. But some of these addictive drugs do activate those same pathways as sex. Exactly. Now, here's an example. Many uh, heroin users, when they shoot up intravenously, will describe the effect of shooting heroin as feeling like an orgasm wow. because it's so similar mm -hmm. to that experience. That's amazing. I, one of the things you do on your website is collect recovery stories and you post them to the front page. So you've probably seen, how many do you think at this point? Well, I, I've read hundreds and hundreds of thousands of posts, <laughs> hundreds of thousands. Uh, we've put up maybe 4,000 complete recovery stories mm -hmm. and another thousand mini ones. And these are stories. We've also put up other stuff. So quite a few, quite a few recovery stories. Uh, the interesting thing is I suspect that the vast majority of the individuals on the forums who actually recover never do a recovery story. Mm -hmm. So after seeing all these stories, what are the common factors you've seen in those that a lot of the guys who are successful and meet their goals all have? Common factors, uh, first of all, is that they usually change their life. Mm -hmm. So th when you first arrive, you go, my goodness, I'm going to white knuckle it. I'm going to count days and I'm going to look at my counter every day. And that works really good up to point. Mm -hmm. But then the brain, you've removed this huge reward, which is internet porn, it has to be replaced. It has to be replaced with real life activities, real life rewards. And in doing that, you basically have to change many things about your life. So it's not just grinning and white knuckling it usually, for most. Unless some, I know some guys personally that had severe erectile dysfunction, and that's the only motivation they needed. <laughs> <laughs> so does one have to be a porn addict to experience these symptoms like PIED? I used to think that, and the reason we used to think that is because back in 2006, 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. the men that arrived on my wife's forum clearly stated, I am addicted, I'm having a heck of a time right. stopping. And most of them were 28 and above, and they had a long history of it. So we assume that maybe addiction was part of it. But 
over the years, now in 2016, we've seen many young men who can quit, quit rather easily, yet they cannot get an erection to a real person. They mm -hmm. may have lost their libido. Some describe their use as non-compulsive. They say, well, I only use it three times a week, but it's been their entire sexual experience. And that's what they condition years. themselves to, yeah. So it's conditioning. Above all, porn-induced sexual problems is conditioning, you know, mm -hmm. deep pop up wing conditioning. Mm. How common do you think these problems have become in modern day civilizations? Do we have reliable statistics on usage and developmental problems? No, we don't have really reliable. Uh, if we look at the population group that is most often on the forums, it's usually about 14 to 30. Mm -hmm. And those, uh, where do they get their studies? It's usually college students. So that's already an odd piece. White college students, you know, yeah. in Northern Europe and the United States maybe. So mm -hmm. it's not real clear. And it's very common reported that a lot of people in this age group, teens and college students, just love to lie on studies, you know, to make <laughs> stuff up. So I'm not sure how reliable it Don't do be. that. If you, if you are given a study, don't lie. Don't lie. You sabotage science. However, uh, looking at various studies in terms of sexual problems, we see that historically, since Kinsey did his first study in 1948, up to about 2000, very consistent stats across all sorts of countries that erectile dysfunction was about 2 to 3 percent in men mm -hmm. under 40. Then, getting to 2008, 2010, 2013, we see it rising in some studies to 24 percent, 27 percent, 33 percent. And so that, of course, is a huge jump, nearly a thousand percent depending on the study. So then you go, well, what variable has changed since 2000 that could cause erectile dysfunction in primarily men under 40? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It must be stress, right? It must be stress because, you know, uh, my father had no stress. He, you know, went through yeah, the stress depression. didn't exist before the second millennium. Yeah, and then he fought in World War II, and then he lost jobs, and so he didn't have any stress. <laughs> and, of course, he smoked, yeah. and our, 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 my family, you know, everyone's family back that ate like crap mm -hmm. and everyone smoked so yeah well with <laughs> such a huge dramatic rise in youthful ED and this very salient factor of unlimited access to free hardcore streaming porn it seems like the medical community must be all over this right yeah you would think so but they're not uh, they're not all over it because what a doctor does is what he learns in school Mm -hmm. So the urologists out there practicing who are 35, 40, 50, 60, they didn't learn anything about porn-induced ED. Yeah. So they think when a young man comes in, it's like, well, what's the problem? Performance anxiety. So what do they ask him? Can you get an erection while you masturbate? But what do they leave out? Are you masturbating to porn? How much are you using? Yeah, so they don't ask if you masturbate to porn. So he is probably masturbating to porn. So he says, yes, I can get an erection. He's masturbating to porn. And the doctor says, hey, you got performance anxiety. Yeah. Because obviously you can not get an better. erection and reach orgasm and there's no organic problem. It's assumed. Yeah. yeah. So that's no problem. So, but here's the nice thing is there's been about three studies, one uh, two years ago and two a month ago, that actually had individuals with young young men, I always say young men, I mean under 40, with uh, sexual dysfunction, anorgasmia, and ED, they had these men give up porn, reduce masturbation, and then they healed these dysfunctions by removing these variables. So that tells us, you know, that porn is causal. Mm -hmm. And so they're starting to come out, but they're slow in coming because people really aren't studying it. Now what about during recovery? I get a lot of guys who ask me this. Say they recover up to the point where they're able to have sex again. Is it okay just to have as many orgasms as, as they want now? Can they go hog wild with it? Or do some guys experience lingering problems with if they have an orgasm, they go back into a flat line? What do you think about that? 
generally we've given the advice to start off slow because mm -hmm. we have observed, they keep reporting that if they start off and go hog wild, then they often do go back in a flat line mm -hmm. or they have to wait several days before they can get a good erection and then that becomes sort of frustrating yeah. and then that might also increase performance anxiety mm -hmm. because now you're wondering well geez I just wore myself out am I going to get an erection you know so so the take more anxiety you have the harder it is to get an erection and they can get mixed together as you know you talk to so many guys and at what point did the porn induced ED then lead to some performance anxiety well it has to lead to some it has to yeah there's only so many times you can have such a negative experience about sex before that negativity becomes associated with sex, at least that was my experience, is that when I was going into a sexual situation, I had all that anxiety and regret and self-doubt that I'd felt in the past came back because I knew I was probably going to fail again. Is yeah, that and that's why many guys choose to go through a reboot and sometimes avoid sex because they don't want to keep reinforcing that embarrassing situation. It's hard on a guy. Really are. A lot of long-term porn users have this moment of clarity either after orgasm or years after starting to use porn where they realize, when did I get into this stuff that I'm watching and when did it become so weird and so extreme or different from what I was originally interested in? Why does that happen? Yeah, why does it happen? So you'll hear there's a myth out there that the internet is just there for you to find your sexuality. So maybe you've been looking at lesbian porn, then heterosexual porn, then gang rape porn, and you end up with bestiality, well, you know, seven years later. Well, of course, you really were into dogs. There's yeah. just no doubt about it. You just you're, didn't you finally know finally found your true calling, which of is course, bestiality. Of course, of course, you know. No, of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, it, it's reported by many, many porn users that they escalate. Uh, they did a survey over on uh, Reddit NoFap, about 55-60% said that they escalated to strange genres. There was a recent study two months ago, the first study, the first study to ask porn users if they had escalated and it discovered that nearly 50% of them had, had ventured into genres that they found previously disgusting mm -hmm. or uninteresting. So that's showing escalating. So it's a normal thing. Why would someone escalate? You habituate, that's the first thing, is you just, okay, well I've seen this over and over again, I've masturbated to this genre, you know, for the last year. Yeah. Whoa, there's something new. New equals novelty. Novelty increases dopamine. Dopamine increases sexual arousal. Or maybe it's like, okay, well that's not even novel. What's that? Oh, gang rape. Whoa, man, that's mm -hmm. sort of upsetting, you know. Anxiety can increase sexual arousal. Three studies from the 80s show that anxiety can increase sexual arousal and thus erections. So often people will move into novel stuff, anxiety producing stuff, shocking stuff. All those can increase dopamine and increase sexual arousal when you're either habituated or desensitize. Desensitize is the next step. The next step is now you have brain changes, such as less dopamine produced, less dopamine receptors, less gray matter. And in fact, Kuhn and Galanot, the 2014 study from Max Planck, found this. They found this in non-compulsive porn users that the more porn you use and the longer you've been using it, the less oh, the less arousal, the less brain activation to mm -hmm. Vanilla porn. And also they found the more porn used, the less gray matter in a part of the reward system that's involved with sexual arousal. So this was found in non-compulsive porn users. So I think it's somewhat normal to escalate and I would just suggest anyone to just think of it as cartoons, you know, it's not who you are. And how do you find out who you are? You unplug. You unplug from it for several months, don't fantasize about it and just let it see, you know, let yourself see who you really are. So you find that a lot of people who escalate, say, to bestiality, if they quit porn, that's not always going to be an interest? They might return to their previous interests? Often. So we have collected story after story of people who just not only no longer find it interesting, find it 
repulsive. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? I can't believe it. Now I just look at the smile of a girl and I can feel an erection coming on. <laughs> Where before they could look at a bunch yeah. of girls gangbanging and they don't feel anything, so they had to go into something else. Uh, it's an amazing time we live in. It is. It's a little bit scary. It's very scary. <laughs> Well, I have some user questions or subscriber questions for you. Porn user questions? Yeah. <laughs> First question is, what is your current streak? My current streak of what? Porn? Yeah. No porn? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Last time I saw a porn film was 1984. Wow. I think. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. No, I found porn boring. I mean, uh, women are great and what teenager didn't love looking at naked women and I certainly did had no moral qualms wasn't religious but I remember the guys after work one night uh, said okay Debbie does Dallas is here let's go watch it and so that was my first real porn porn film you know triple X so I went to it in our CD theater theater and we're all sitting back you know four of us watching it and to me it was like an anatomy film it's like mm -hmm. what what is this and it just bored me and I left. So you never struggled with it yourself, you just saw a lot of suffering and need out there and decided you could be able to fill that gap. Yeah, so when you get letters or emails from young men who are suicidal because they think they're ruined for life, that's the motivation. You know then that if the few that contact you are in such deep water and think they're ruined for life, then there's a massive amount of people out there in deep water. Mm -hmm. They just aren't reaching out. Are reaching out. And of course it happened to you. You suffered because you didn't know the cause. Yeah. If you knew the cause, you would have gotten <laughs> done something about it a lot sooner. Yeah. Right, so that was the motivation. Can you recover from porn-induced erectile dysfunction just by quitting porn but continue masturbating in moderation, say, once per week? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Have men done it? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but we have, you know, here's the thing, it's about the whole porn-induced ED thing. You know, the questions are, what do I do and what I don't do? And you have to become really your own doctor. You have to observe how, certain, how orgasm affects you, uh, how, how you manifest a flat line, how aroused you are by real people, and you have to modify your reboot week by week, month by month. And so, yes, uh, we have definitely seen, especially older uh, men, recover by continuing to ejaculate. We've seen, though, some younger men who really needed a gap. They needed a gap of masturbation to really jumpstart the event. I put up a rebooting account maybe two weeks ago of this guy who went for two and a half years doing that method didn't make any progress. Finally, he took like a four, five month break from masturbation, kicked in, then it and then he's healed at three years. Wow. So, so we don't give, that's, that's the problem. We don't give him a YBOP, do this and don't do mm -hmm. that, because we don't know your situation. Only you know your situation. So there's no guide like on day 62 you should be doing this, and on day 78 you should be doing that. Each person has to experiment with what works for them, right? They have to, and that's normal. I mean, we experiment with diet, we experiment with exercise, we experiment with herbs, drugs, vitamins, you name it. So we can experiment with our sexuality. So the way I usually explain it, and I'd like to get your feedback on this, is it's like an injury, right? We've injured our brains to a certain extent by overstimulating them over years using pornography. And if, say, I sprain my ankle playing basketball, an activity like jogging, which would normally be fine, will actually delay the healing process of my ankle. So I tell guys that an activity like masturbation, which normally isn't very harmful, might delay that healing process for their brains as well. Would you agree with that? You know, it's, I don't even want, I, I've used that analogy somewhat mm -hmm. similar, and here's the thing. It really depends. So let's think about masturbation. So if we have a young man who's pretty much all of his sexuality is in masturbation, he's sort of reinforcing getting an erection and ejaculating in that same hunched over position or using his hand. And so he's continuing that training. So he might do well to have a break. So his brain is like, where do I go? Where do I go for my arousal? 
and then he can slowly start to get aroused by a real partner. You know, he really is sort of trying to wipe things a little bit clean. So I think it's good advice, um, but we just we just can't give an, a prescription for everyone. Yeah. And, but you know that. Yeah, absolutely. I asked some questions that I already know the answers to. I know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> Oh, here's a good one from another uh, another a NoFap user. How rich have you gotten from your anti-porn crusade? I'm a billionaire. <laughs> uh, not very rich. Uh, so let's look at this. Do I make money? No, I only spend money. My website has no ads and we accept no donations. So there's no money to be made off the website. Mm -hmm. The book that's at the front, I make no money off of that. I My portions, proceeds from that book, go to a charity. So I've made no money. So I pay for the servers, I pay for everything. So no money, only money down the drain. Yeah, some people see, oh, he has millions of views and a lot of traffic. He must be making good money. But they don't realize that some people are just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. That's well, you know, they look at the website. How do you make money on websites? You make it through advertising. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing there. It never happens. <laughs> yeah. So there's no money to be made. <laughs> And I, I don't, I don't do talks. Don't get, don't charge for that. So it's mm -hmm. just. But I think I'll charge you for this. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that would be billed. <laughs> <laughs> so another good one I got from a subscriber is: Do you offer any different advice to gay men who are recovering porn addicts? Do you see anything different in trends among them, or any different advice? No, I don't think we do. Uh, you know, a brain is a brain, mm -hmm. and a reward system is a reward system, and it's been altered and trained to become aroused to everything associated with the porn use. You know, whether it's constantly clicking, being a voyeur, searching for something novel, a particular genre. So it really is the same to unhook mm -hmm. and then rewire to the real thing. And the the person will have to choose whether they want to have sex and, and to ejaculate, but it comes down to those same two principles pretty much for everyone. Mm -hmm. And this isn't part of the user question, but how about for women? Women, it, it comes down to the same. What they may also have to eliminate is vibrator use. Mm -hmm. So many of the women we've seen who have had sexual problems they combine the vibrator with internet porn. So they're going to have to remove that and then again slowly acclimate to partner sex. Yeah, because the cue and the stimuli that comes from a vibrator is pretty different from what comes from a penis and a real partner. Well, I would imagine. I would imagine. I use one myself. Neither have I, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of controversy. A lot of sexologists say, oh, that's no problem, but you know, it's a super normal stimulus, something that has never been encountered before in evolution. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the user questions I got that I wanted to ask you. Okay. Do you have anything else that you think we didn't cover in this interview that's really important for people out there to know? I don't know. <laughs> I think. Well, I, I would like to point out a little thing, a few things about research. Mm -hmm. So we, we discussed it briefly, and if you can go to the front YBOP, uh, I have two or three stickies right there all the time, and one is brain studies on porn users. We have 26 listed, all 26 align with the porn addiction model. So no matter what you've heard out there, uh, there are no studies that falsify the porn addiction model. If you do read that some studies have, you'll usually see the name Prowse, and the study cited will be Prowse et al. 2015. However, that study found desensitization in heavy porn users, and five peer-reviewed papers have stated that Prowse et al. 2015 supports the porn addiction model and that its, its subjects were habituated or desensitized to normal porn. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to mention is now we have about 15 studies that link uh, porn use to erectile dysfunction, anorgasmia, delayed ejaculation, and lower brain activation or desensitization to sexual stimuli. So that's on the front page too. So the science is really supporting the material on YBOP and supporting what many of 
the people out there are now experiencing. Mm -hmm. Now you've also written a great book about this called Your Brain on Porn, and it's basically, correct me if I'm wrong, a summary of all you've learned and published on your website. Is that right? Yeah, so we, we tried to make it short. We were asked to do it. I didn't want to write a book, but said, okay. I said, all the stuff's <laughs> on the website. Why would I write a book? So we wrote a book, and uh, <laughs> wow, that's magical. Wrote a book, and it is a nice summary, and a lot of people like to use it. Mm -hmm and it just sort of condenses everything. Where can people get it? Well, you can click on yourbrainonporn.com and it takes you to Amazon or takes you to, if you want a PDF version to the publisher, mm -hmm. and you can buy it there. So you can buy it, I guess, in paperback form and also in a much cheaper PDF or Kindle form. Great, everyone should do it, it's a great book. <laughs> and I also had a lot of people who emailed me back and said, I don't have any questions for him, I just want you to tell him how much I appreciate what he's done. I feel the same way, so thank you very much. You bet. That's been great, Gary. Very good.